you want to get on the action, we want to hear from you. Hit us up, faderoutemail at gmail.com. Slide in our DMs on IG at Fade Route Podcast. Drop us a DM on Twitter at Fade Route DNZ. Comment on our YouTube channel, The Fade Route with DNZ. Questions, comments, picks, segment suggestions, you name it, we want to hear from you. Get at us, in crowd. Welcome to The Fade Route with D and Z. Here are your hosts, D and Z. Welcome, everybody, to this week's episode of The Fade Route with D and Z. I am Z, and I am so fed up with the New York Giants. It is not even funny. Can Evan Ingram catch a football? I know he can't catch cold, but this is ridiculous. And I, wait, wait, wait. I think they just threw another penalty flag in the fourth quarter and made Carson's, Carson Wentz look like a world beater. That was pathetic. And football season for me is officially over. It is now Hallmark movie season. And here he is. I've known this guy since our days on Carousel Shoes. Flight crew through and through the last QB in St. John's history. What is up, D? Hey, man. I mean, it was a pretty bad game, but it was also entertaining, no? No, it was entertaining. Yeah, I'll give you that. It was entertaining. Golden Tate showed up, so it's nice to see that. Boston Scott made Julius Peppers his bitch. So that was interesting. (laughs) Jake Elliott can make a 61-yard field goal, but he can't make a 29-yard chip shot. Neither team deserved to win that game. If if there was, you know, if there was any justice in the NFL, that would have ended in a tie and just really made the NFC East even worse than it already was. I mean... Wentz was great late, though. I mean, he made two unbelievable passes. The last one to five foot six Scott for the go-ahead touchdown. I, that was pretty impressive. I mean, he's playing with, you know, not his full squad. They've got a string of guys they got together there, and they came back and won that game. Um, Daniel Jones had a nice eighty-yard run. But he also led the team in rushing yards. He's still turning over the football. I believe the Giants are 0-15 against the Eagles and the Cowboys the last few years. And it just doesn't look like Daniel Jones is getting any better at protecting the football. No. No, he's not. And, I mean, it's a microcosm of the season. He breaks off an 80-yard run, then trips over his own two feet. Sprinkler system came out of nowhere. Yeah, it was the Buffalo Wild Wings commercial. It was just ridiculous. And then, I mean, let's start getting people from Little Giants. I mean, I know that movie is it was made in 1994, but, you know, they, they taught Hanan to, to catch the toilet paper. Maybe they need to try that with Evan Ingram, you know? Just practice with toilet paper, and then when the game comes, he'll be able to catch the friggin' football. They're talking about trading him at the depth. What would you possibly get for him? I mean, if I'm any GM worth my salt, I'm not giving you any more than maybe a fifth or a sixth. You're not going to get anything of value for him. This is the first year he's been really, truly healthy throughout, and he's underperforming. So I'm not trying to place the blame all on Evan Ingram, but there he's got a hefty plate. He's got a hefty plate of it. I mean, as a professional football player, you need to make that catch. Catches that ball, they probably win the game. I mean, the the Eagles still had, I think, two timeouts and a two-minute warning. But there's a good chance the Giants hold on to win that game and would have a share of first place in the worst division in football. Which is like, you know, a shit sandwich at this point. <laughs> it's like, that, that's fantastic. Like being the smartest kid with Down syndrome. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> it's like, you know, you're the kid who forgets to plug, to plug the fork in the electrical outlet. You know, congratulations. It's time for the fading where we give a nod to the trending sports stories of the week. 
Thursday night game is, you know, it's pretty uh, fresh in our minds. But, I mean, we also have a World Series to talk about. And I think we should also talk about your buddy, Rob Manfred, uh, and how he's destroying the game of baseball. He Well, we go from that crappy football game to the World Series, which has actually been a very good palate cleanser. You've had a back and forth. You know, the series is tied at one. The pitching has been there to some extent. The bats have been there. You know, this is exactly what you wanted if you were a baseball fan. Just two teams going at each other, and it's going to take a knockout blow. This is going to, as of right now, this is going seven. Like, you can just, I can just see it that it's going to go seven. And it really is a toss up at this point as to who is going to win. But, to your point, you ju- you just mentioned it. That jackass Rob Manfred came out the other day talking about the rule changes that he thinks will stick next year, and one of them is that stupid, stupid <laughs> rule of the runner on second in extra innings. It is absolutely ridiculous. That well, just to, that- clar- just to clarify for our viewers, uh, amongst the rule changes he's thinking about keeping, uh, he wants to keep the runner on second. He wants to expand the playoffs. Uh, he also wants to start limiting defensive shifts. Um, and he also wants to keep the rule for the relievers pitching to a minimum of a certain amount of batters. Okay, so we'll take these one at a time. We know how I feel about the runner on second at this point. You know, um, the pitch limits uh, for relievers, I think it's fine. I think you actually have to use a little bit more strategy. When do you actually put your lefty in? And who can you actually, who can actually pitch to more than one guy? And it, it really challenges the players to grow. So that guys like, I mean, I love you, Jerry, but Jerry Blevins, like you, you actually have to start pitching to other guys other than lefties and limiting the number of defensive shifts. Yeah, that will, that's going to spur offense. So I can see where that would be something that you would want to do. I don't know if there's going to be significant pushback by Tony Clark and the players union. I think there would be just for this, just because of the way that Major League Baseball is gone. And for expanded playoffs, I don't know if you want to do 14 per. I really don't know what the magic number is, but <clears throat> that's fine. You know, you, you can expand the playoffs, but not to the point where it's going to be half the league. Like, I think there has to be some number in there. Maybe it's 12 teams. Like, maybe 12 is the magic number. I don't know, but... There, that's an expanded playoff is fine. Keep the runner off second base in extra innings, and I'm still, you know, I'm still not a hundred percent sure. Flip a coin on the D, universal DH. I prefer my pitchers to hit. I'm a National League fan, but that's just me. What say you? Uh, I got to disagree with you on on almost all of them. Um, I uh, I hate all the new rules. Listen, baseball is a shark. It has stood the test of time. It does not need any modifications. It is the perfect sport, okay? Limiting defensive shifts. How about players start going the other way? If you have a problem with somebody shifting on you, lay down a bunt, slap the ball the other way. All Teach guys how to play the game of baseball, okay? The runner on second base rule, how is that fair to the home team? So it's the top of the 10th and the, the, the visiting team gets gets their runner on second base. And now I have to try to figure this out. And since I had and, and now I have to make sure my pitcher is pitching only three guys. Get out of here. That's trash. That's straight up trash. And then you want to expand the playoffs. Then what's the point of playing 162 games? Then get rid of the 162 games. Play 101 games, play 100 games, and then expand the playoffs. You're devaluing the bait. You're devaluing the regular season, which is probably the most prestigious regular season of all the sports because of how many games they play and how daunting it is and how much time that goes into it and all the stats that are accumulated. What's the point of doing that? 
and the and the the, the limiting the amount of um and putting a a number on how many pitchers uh you can use regarding relieving and pitching to a certain number of batters get that shit out of here look at the rays the rays have a bullpen game coming up because they're built to handle that now other teams have to justify and modify and create their rosters so that they can put guys in there that can stand the test of time. Oh, and because they're you're limiting to how many people they can pitch to, that's going to speed the game up. What about the, now more hits are going to be allowed because specialists can't pitch to that 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 left hander. They got to pitch to the right hander too, making the game longer. I disagree with all of it. I'm not a fan of his. I don't think he handled the coronavirus very well. And I think he's trying to put his stamp on the game, and they don't need his stamp. So Rob Manfred, don't need you, honestly. Well, well, my thing is this. Rob Manfred and Tony Clark at this point are the Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi of Major League Baseball. Nothing they say, nothing they do will ever result in compromise and are not going well, I get, to. But I get where Tony Clark's coming from. I, I actually side with him. I get what he's saying as far as the players are concerned and players wanting to get paid and get in their share. I'm all for that. But Rob Manfred is trying to change the game of baseball. And that's – there's nothing wrong with the game of baseball. If you don't like baseball, don't watch baseball. You want to watch from the seventh inning on, watch from the seventh inning on. But, Doesn't bother me. You know, but, you, want, you, want to, you want to engage fans more. You want to lower the prices. Shorten the season. Mm-hmm. Make, make that's that's how you're going to get fans intrigued more. Not expanding the playoffs. Come on, you're going to watch more playoff games. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get no, out of here. I you know what I agree with shortening the season. 154 is probably like the best number. I would say start it on Jackie Robinson Day when you know just go from there. You know, uh, that's you a good place. Do. Yeah, that would be a fine place to start. You know. Um, they are, they're not selling to us, man. We're in the, the latter end. We're at the tail end of the 18th to 35 demo. We're actually in the 36 to what, 49 or something like that. They're not selling to us. They're trying to sell to the ADD riddled millennials who can only keep focus for about 30 minutes or so, which is why, you know, you have sports like basketball with a running clock. They have constantly have music going. You're constantly being, you're constantly being. Um, go more, go yeah. more to the let them play model. Let's mic up the players. Allow yeah. them to chat at each other. Yeah. I thought that was so great. I think it was uh, during, I want to say it was either during the All Star game or maybe in the preseason. They mic'd up Freddie Freeman and he was talking about like. When he was seeing pitches, he was like, "Well, didn't expect that one. Wasn't ready for that." Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Well, here I'm done. Like yeah. that to me is much more enticing. That to me is exciting. Or hearing what the first baseman talks about with the runner when he gets on first base. Right. That to me is something that no other sport is doing. Michael, the players up and yeah. have the PR department go through it and make sure that whatever hits the live wire is fair and it's okay. That to me is much more exciting. Than anything else for for a millennial have live time tweeting, have live time Instagram shots. When the guy's coming around first, after he hits a home run, he wants to do an Instagram shot at third base. Liven that up. But don't touch the rules. Don't touch the the feet to the bases. Don't touch the put runners on second. Don't mess with my game. Unfortunately, the cat's out of the bag, the horse is out of the barn, whatever animal you want to talk about. It's just it's it's the point of no return. I don't see them going back to the purists game. And anytime no, no. You... there's no money in that. There's no. no money in that. There's no money in that. But he's gotta come up with something better. No. And we, you know, while not you know, I'm fired up now. So, you know, going let's go right into the World Series. It's it's clear that the Dodgers and the Rays are the two most deserving teams of being here. They're battling it out. I think game game three is on right now. But I want to go. I want to talk about Clayton Kershaw because you know what? Everybody was giving him a lot of respect after he pitched in game one. He shut down the Rays, six innings pitched, two hits, one earned run. But that's what he's supposed to do to the Tampa Bay Rays because you know what? Up until this point, his playoff career, in my opinion, has been dog shit especially for how much this guy gets paid. And all of a sudden, he comes in game one, 
in a game where he's supposed to win, a team he's supposed to dominate, does exactly what he's supposed to do, and, oh, he's a future Hall of Famer. He's a great player. He's their best. But I like Walker Bueller better than I like him. And I'm not and – I'm, I'm, and listen, you know what? I will eat crow. I will go back on everything I said. Go out and win the World Series, dude. Game five Sunday, come out and shut him out again. Shut him down again. Win, make it the pip, game five in this series is going to be the pivotal game. Okay? So you're going to have an opportunity to maybe put your team up or even your series. Go out there and win that game. That's how you're going to get respect from me. You're not going to get respect from me because you shut down the Tampa Bay Rays in six innings in game one of the World Series. You could you could take that to wherever you want to go with it. I'm with you on that. Game one of the World Series this year was the outlier. The man's pitching to an ERA over five in the World Series. Just because you have one game doesn't mean you turn the corner. You need to do it again. And I'm 100% with you on that. Hell, you know what? If it gets to game seven, your ass better be coming out of the bullpen too. If Randy Johnson and Kurt Schilling could literally pitch every other day to beat the Yankees, you can do that too. That's what I'm trying to say. Like you're gonna you're gonna start talking about this guy when guys like Randy Johnson single handedly won the two thousand I think it was a two thousand one World Series. Get out of town. Randy came out of the bullpen. Everything he was he pitched so much in that series. And you know what? I'm you know I'm not a Yankee fan. I don't like the Yankees. But Andy Pettit, I take Andy Pettit over this clown. Mm-hmm. Andy Pettit was shut him down. He had one bad game against the Diamondbacks in 2001. But other than that, when he rejoined the Yankees, I think back in 2009, and even in all the World Series games he pitched before that, guys a stud. Guys, a stud. I believe he was the even the guy that was pitching in the Atlanta game where they won the close game. So I think he was the one that was pitching the one nothing game, right? Yeah, the one. It was him versus Smoltz. Yeah, yeah. So that was a it was a classic, a classic yeah. game. I don't want to. I don't want to hear about how great Clayton Kershaw did against the Tampa Bay Rays because you know what? I'm a Braves fan and we slapped him up the first time we saw him, and but, it, he is not that great. But that's the thing. Greatness gets thrown around way, too way too much. Yeah, often. way too much. Way too much. You gotta Everybody's earn it. Everybody, like, why is he a Hall of Famer? What the hell did he do? He got rings. He got rings that I don't know about. He plays on one of the most expensive teams in baseball. Two to line up that one through nine are enormous. Muncy, Bellinger, Mookie Betts, probably top three player in the game. Yeah. And you're gonna come and pump your chest out. Get out of town. Get out of town. Justin Turner, one of the probably the best hitting Dodger hit in playoff history. Good regular season pitcher. Doesn't deliver the goods in the postseason. Does it one time and everybody's on his jock. I'm not getting on it. I want more. I want more. Especially all these years you guys have been here and you cried all last time because the the, the, the Astros were stealing your signs and all that other garbage. Come out here and beat these guys. Get out there in game five and show me something else. This is the first time they saw you. Let's see what happens. Well, bottom line is this. Fire this is up. this is make or break for the Dodgers. If they do not win this year, you have to consider either a managerial change or you have to you have to seriously consider breaking up this team in some form or fashion. You need to do something because you're running the same. You're running relatively the same team out there to the same results. Nothing is going to get you over the hump. Sometimes you need to make a. Sometimes you need to make change for the sake of change. Yeah, but this is the year they're a far superior team than the team they're playing. But if they lose, like you, you. I don't. I don't. I don't see them losing. But I'm just trying to say, like, they're a far superior team this year to the team they're playing. In the previous years, Astros gave them a run for their money. National League competition leading up to the World Series gave them a hard time. This year, they're a far superior team. So they're out of I excuses. agree with you. But I don't, I'm not going to even go there as in what happens if they don't win. Because I think they will win, especially if it goes seven. Yeah. You know, The thing about it is, is for them to win the World Series, right, 
Mm-hmm. They're going to need one of their other pitchers to show up, right? Because you can you can give the wins to Bueller and you can give the wins to Kershaw. You're still one game short. So at some point, somebody else in that pitching staff is going to have to win a game. Because in my opinion, they can't win the bullpen game. Because their bullpen game is a mess. You start seeing guys you didn't even know were on the team. You're like, who is this guy? The <laughs> Rays have been doing this all season. They know how to pitch a bullpen game. And they and their guys, like like uh, Cash says, my guys throw 98-2. And they throw fire. And unless you're putting a bat on the ball, you ain't going to keep up with that. But it, it goes to show you how much Kevin Cash has these guys shook. Look what happened last series with the Yankees. Aaron Boone got taken out of his game by just the mere thought that Kevin Cash might do something. But he is living rent free in managers' heads right now. And that is, you know, that's a great strategic point for him because he can just play it straight like he has been. He, they haven't really been doing anything outside the box. Outside of maybe going Ryan Yarborough for what two innings, three innings, like that's really the most outside the box, and that's really that's inside the Rays box. And you talk about you talk about Dave Roberts, you talk about making the managerial t- change. There's no there's no thinking that has to go on on his side of the ball. No. Like he don't he don't got to do anything. Like Kevin Cash has to find ways to win every day. Dave Roberts is throwing out the best lineup in baseball every day. And if he's and if he's got one of his two studs on the mound, he don't gotta think much about that either. If he, most of the time he's sitting in a dugout with a smile on and his even his face mask down because hey man, let's go play. Yeah. Go play. He'll gotta he'll gotta coach Mookie Betts. He'll gotta coach Kershaw. He'll gotta coach Muncie, who I believe was was cut by another team, and now he's the number four hitter on the, the L.A. Dodgers. I think Billy Bean wants that one back. He was an A. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's right. He was an A, and he cut him. He now cut he's him. he's fucking he's playing first base and roping, smirking shots all over the field yeah. for the L.A. Dodgers. Dave Josh Rob- Peterson was almost an angel. He's he's a stud player too. Yeah, well, studded. The lineup is totally star-studded, and Dave Roberts now is what Joe Torre was in the mid-2000s with the Yankees. We had an all-star at every position, and you had multiple Cy Young winners in your rotation, and you couldn't get past the Angels, and you couldn't get past the Tigers. You know, so, And then they eventually, he got replaced. Like They brought in Joe Girardi. Sometimes you need a new voice, and maybe that's the case. But like you said, we are putting the cart before the horse. The series isn't over yet, so we're just going to have to sit back, relax, and, you know, pop some popcorn and maybe have some hot dogs and just watch the show. Yeah, enjoy the show. It's a, it, baseball, is, baseball is a great game. I'm getting hungry over here. Should have cooked up some dinner. And if you're looking for a new cooking show to binge, check out As You Eat It on YouTube, hosted by me, Chef Z. I invite you into my home and show you what and how I cook when I'm off the clock as a chef instructor. You're going to learn fun recipes and creative methods to empower and inspire you in the kitchen and take it to the next level. Cook how you want to cook. Eat how you want to eat. Eat as you eat it. That's As You Eat It, available only on YouTube. A-Z, you eat it. Check it out, and let's get cooking. Uh, Speaking of guys who are learning on the job, Baker Mayfield. <laughs> yes, I was just about to say that. Let me let me get into a little rant about Baker Mayfield. But to his credit, and I guess this is a good question for you, is is it so bad that Baker Mayfield can't beat the Ravens and can't beat the Steelers because those are the two losses on his schedule this year. Is that bad? Is that a bad thing? It is a bad thing if you expect something out of the Cleveland Browns. If you're like, I'm going to say, this is what I'm going to say. I don't think that's bad. I don't think that's bad. You know what? But you know what is bad? What's bad is, is you were 10 for 18 
for 119 <laughs> yards with a touchdown and two interceptions. Mm. That's bad. That's a problem. I have a problem with that. I have a problem with your commercials. I have a problem with your mouth. I don't want to hear you. I want to see you play well. I root for the guy. I like the guy. I got a bunch of his rookie cards sitting in my closet right now because I thought he was going to be a really good player. What's the comparison for him? Pat Mahomes? Pat Mahomes, I believe, is in the same draft as him. And this is this is what we got? The same draft as Sam Darnold and Patrick Mahomes. Well, Patrick Mahomes is clearly, clearly no, he head wasn't. and shoulders. Think, ever. Hold on. Maybe he wasn't. He wasn't. I don't. Uh, Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson was in that draft. I'm sorry. Lamar Jackson was in that draft. And Sam Darnold was in that draft. I believe Pat Mahomes was the year before. That was the year before when they traded up? Yeah. Well, either way, like Patrick Mahomes is in a different category. They they are both mobile quarterbacks, and then I think that's where the comparison ends. Um, even with Lamar Jackson, you know, a reigning MVP, he's a mobile quarterback. That's where the comparison to Baker Mayfield ends. Those guys don't run their mouths and beat their chests and talk about how great they are. And oh, if you're not on the train, get off. Didn't he say that to Duke Johnson? Something. Yeah. That? Yeah. Yeah. Like, what train? The shit train? <laughs> like, sure. Okay, fine. But that's great. But, dude, eventually, you are you have to cash the checks that your mouth is writing. And he ain't doing it. He just is not doing it. And you put Beckham there. You put Hooper there. You had Njoku. You have Hunt. You have Chung. You have Jarvis Landry. You have, I mean... He's surrounded. Daniel Jones wishes he had a at least one of those guys, but he's making chicken shit out of this chicken salad. It's supposed to be the other way around, Baker. I want to see better play. That's what I want to see. I don't mind. Like I said, I don't mind. Listen, the Baltimore Ravens come after you. Okay, the. Pittsburgh Steelers come after you. They're looking to get you. So I don't have a problem with you losing to them. But the numbers are god awful. God awful. The most accurate. And some of these people were trying to say that you were the next Drew Brees. Get out of town. So the whole thing was is okay. So so Baker was drafted in 2018. Mahomes was drafted in 2017, but they had that legendary game where it was Oklahoma against Texas Tech where they pretty much, you know, threw for almost like a 1,000 yards and like nine touchdown passes. <sighs> but the thing is, is like Pat Mahomes wasn't a first, wasn't a number one overall pick. No. Okay? Pat Mahomes has a Super Bowl ring. Pat Mahomes has an MVP trophy. Okay. You, my friend, need to get your act together. Joe, Bur- these look like Joe Burrow numbers. You're supposed to be better than Joe Burrow. You've been in the league two more years than Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow just got here. You had the same stat line, very similar against the Ravens. Yeah. Well, that is credit to the Ravens. They are a better team than you know than the Browns. It's clear. Um, the closest player comp. In terms of size, mobility, arm strength, and you know what? Baker Makefield isn't going to like this comp. He's Johnny Manziel without the drinking problem. <laughs> He's Tyrod Taylor. He's Tyrod Taylor with two inflated lungs. Yes. <laughs> Who just got cleared to play, by the way. That's crazy. But I think that change is done. If I'm Anthony Lynn... You know, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's done, you know. And Tyrod Taylor's, once again, the bridesmaid. But you got, but you have players like Jarvis Landry and Odell Beckham Jr. Like looking around, like, gee, I don't know if I want to be here anymore. You know, I don't know if this guy can get me the football. Yeah. Like I don't, I don't know. Like, what more can the Browns do 
for Baker Mayfield. What more could they do? I the got, I got is, The line is solid. I mean, Joe Thomas ain't there, but no. the line is solid. He's got two tight ends, Hooper and Njoku. Njoku's coming back. I think Hooper just had, like, his appendix taken out or something, so he's out. Yeah. But you got you got Kareem Hunt, who would have been on the Super Bowl team if had, if he didn't get in trouble a couple of years ago. Nick Chubb, who was a stud college player at Georgia, he's a five-star running back. I mean, he's hurt, but he's going to come back. You got the receivers. Odell Beckham has got a ton of talent. Jarvis Landry catches everything thrown in his direction. He ain't getting anything thrown in his direction. And well, the passes, the passes don't even have zip on them. No. They don't have any. It's like uh, maybe he's not putting the work in. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, well, neither do I. But, I mean, but that's the thing. It's the Cleveland Browns. I think we're putting more thought into it than they do. But there is an idea. I do have one to help the Cleveland Browns along. And that's trade for Ryan Fitzpatrick because it's two a time in Miami. How'd you feel about that? Uh, you know, just to fill everybody in, you know, Ryan Fitzpatrick was pretty emotional, uh, pretty upset about the transition. He really thought that, you know, this team was his team. They were two and three. Um, I was kind of shocked by the move and I kind of felt bad for Ryan Fitzpatrick because you know, I don't see a problem with a quarterback sitting for a year or two. We saw that happen with Patrick Mahomes. We saw that happen with Aaron Rodgers. There's nothing wrong with sitting back for a year or two and learning an offense. And listen, you're the Miami Dolphins. You're two and three. Fitzpatrick is playing great. The, 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 the Patriots don't look like world beaters this year. The Buffalo Bills are, are really, they're right with you as far as, you know, are, they're, they're not world beaters. You can beat them. The Jets are awful. Why now? Because of the bye week? Like, unless Tua's really blowing them away in practice, I really question this move. It's a head scratcher for sure. Ryan Fitzpatrick has been playing great. Um, let's take it all the way back to 2004 when um... – Kurt Warner was the quarterback for the Giants, and uh, they benched him for Eli Manning at 5-4, and four, and the season went into a tailspin. Now, Kurt Warner was not playing nearly as well as Ryan Fitzpatrick was, so I get where Fitzy would be disrespected and would be upset with the timing of it. But Fitzpatrick had to have known it was coming. So he, sh- he could have braced himself a little bit better. I mean, all in all, he handled it as well as he could have handled it. He handled it like a human being. He, it wasn't robotic. Like, I'm just, you know, no, none of the Crash Davis cliche bullshit. He said how he felt, and I can respect him for that. But knowing Tua Tonga Vailoa, hey, I said it right. All right, cool. Um, knowing his injury history in Alabama, Fitzy could see some burn later in the year. It's just, you know, he's going to have to bide his time a little bit. And if he struggles, if Tua struggles, Fitzy's going to have, he's going to be back in the game anyway. And if they're in the playoff hunt, even, even with Tua, I could see Fitzpatrick being in there. So all he has to do is keep doing what he's doing. Keep showing up to practice, keep grooming Tua and things will be okay. Do do I think they're going to make the playoffs, especially with the expanded format this year? Maybe. But, you know, the last thing that that locker room needs is any kind of revolt. So just keep keep plugging away, fill your lunch pail, and go to work. Were you on board with the move? I wasn't on board with the move, but I understand where Coach Flo is coming from. There's really no right way to do things because Troy Aikman started immediately. Peyton Manning started immediately. And, you know, it, it depends on the, the quarterback. It depends on the system that you're running. If he is learning something completely different, completely new, sitting will definitely help. But if you're running a similar offense to what they had in college, 
then you could step in right away. You know, that you're seeing that with Joe Burrow right now. Not that they gave him much of a choice anyway. But, yeah, I, I think it's different strokes for different folks, man. And, you know, having a steadying force like Fitzy definitely helps. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think one of the things he's worried about is he's kind of wondering, like, you know, is this my last – was that my last NFL game? You know, he's getting older now. And I think, you know, I think he's got a lot of football left. I think everyone could always use a veteran like him because uh, he could throw the football. I mean, he can throw he, – he can put it all over the place. Uh, but I did feel for him. I felt bad for him because, uh, you know, it's not like he came off of a bad game. Like, he came off of shutting out the Jets, you know, and he's been trying to take the young kid under his wing and, you know, teach him a few things and – you know, they, they haven't had, like, bad losses, uh, but I guess, you know, it, I guess it was time. Yeah. I, guess it, I, it, I, I think I think they had – this was the plan all along. <clears throat> the plan all along was to get to the bye week and at the bye week make the change, regardless how well or how bad they were doing. I think the anticipation was that they were going to be better – they were going to be worse off than they were, definitely. But Yeah. Yeah, you know, they didn't they didn't estimate that they'd be doing as good as they are. Yeah. So I can see where they would want to stick to the plan. But at the same time, if you have the opportunity to put your foot on the gas a little bit, put your foot on the gas a little bit. You can the the, the Bills aren't pay, playing that well, the Patriots aren't playing that well, and the Jets are the drizzling shits. So yeah, what do you think is going on with the the Patriots? Do you think they turned around this week against the 49ers? Oh, that game against the Broncos, man. It was a field goal fest. But you uh, almost wonder you almost wonder if Cam is hurt or you know, he was missing his receivers pretty badly. Now, granted, they didn't have practice. They didn't practice all week. No. And he was already coming off of the COVID, but I mean in, on the last drive, Julian Edelman threw the ball twice. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it really makes you wonder how well Cam is feeling. I mean, coming off COVID, even if you're asymptomatic, your body does kind of you, – you do – you're going to be fatigued, and it's going to take a while to get you back up to, you know, 100%. So it's possible that he's just, you know, fatigued. Like he just – you know, that's one of the symptoms of COVID. So <laughs> – you know, who's to say that Cam Newton wasn't feeling it late in the quarter, and that's why they were starting with the trickeration. The problem is, is that it didn't really work because they lost. But yeah. you know, they're going up against the they're going up against stiffer competition this week. Hopefully, I mean they they were they were in position to they were in position to win the game. I mean, they had a chance to win at the end. Yeah, but. But a but, lot of that you, know, you, you don't expect the Broncos to come into Gillette and no. win. No. But I do I, I also don't expect Vic Fangio to be as conservative as he was, you know. Brandon McManus had a game he had a hell of a game. But if you were just a little bit more aggressive, you could have buried the Patriots early. But, yeah. but that's on Pat Shermer. And I got very used to Pat Shermer being super conservative and then you know, trying to explain it away in the press conferences as, as anything. But, yeah, like you had the opportunity and you'd rather kick the field goal. Like it is what it is. It was a choice that you made. But to, for Cam Newton, I think a full week of practice is going to definitely help him. And um, we'll definitely go over that in our pick segment, though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, what, that's called a teaser, boys and girls. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we got – Got really two really grown men running backs coming to lead the league in just overall play in Derrick Henry and Alvin Kamara. Now, when you look at the body of work, is there a particular back that you favor over the other? Do you like the the shifty, I can catch the ball out of the backfield, run over you, lead the team in touches and scoring, or do you like the grown man approach of Derrick Henry who accounted for over 250 total yards against the Texans on Sunday and just starts throwing around people that weigh just as much as he does? 
it is amazing what Derrick Henry is able to do. Like he's superhuman. But like, it's I think Josh Norman is still flying. But you know, there's something to be said about having a guy as versatile as Alvin Kamara, especially since he doesn't have Michael Thomas this week and Emmanuel Sanders. You know, you're, it, it gives you an extra dimension to your offense, having that guy who can not only run between the tackles, bounce it outside, but he can also catch the ball out of the backfield. It's kind of like, it's kind of like what Reggie Bush could have been if he was a little bit bigger and wanted to run between the tackles. Like Alvin Kamara is kind of the full form of what that was. And, you know, what Deuce McAllister and Reggie Bush put together for the Saints. I mean, that, that's a pretty, I mean, Alvin Kamara is a beast. Derrick Henry's a beast. Would I have, would I take them on my team? The answer is yes. I would take either. But I think Alvin Kamara, with the injuries that are going on right now and the situation with the Saints, I think I would rather have him right now. Yeah, I kind of agree with you on that. I like the shifty back. I like the guy that can catch a, a, a ball behind the line of scrimmage and just take it 50 yards for a touchdown. Uh, he's going to be up for a heavy day of running the ball and catching the ball with, like you said, Sanders and Michael Thomas are both out this week. Um, and they have a, they have a big time game on Sunday where they're going to be expected to really win. This is an AFC bout against the Panthers. Um, and Drew Brees is going to have to play really well. Absolutely. And he, I mean, we, we'll see what happens because Carolina does have a rather porous defense, but I mean, a lot of guys hurt. <clears throat> it, it, so, so we, you know, one of the things we talked about last week was the Le'Veon Bell getting out of New York and uh, actually signed with the Chiefs. Uh, you know, in your opinion, what does this mean? What does this mean for you know Edwards Edwards Hilaire? Um, you know, the team is rushing the ball very well. They had over 245 yards last game. They seem to be – they're not a run-first team, but they're flexing their muscles running the ball, and it doesn't look like they can be stopped on, you know, whether they're throwing it or running it. So, you know, what do you what do you see Le'Veon Bell's role being in the Chiefs' offense? If Clyde Edwards-Hilaire keeps running the ball the way he's been running the ball – He's going to be the bell cap. Le'Veon Bell is going to end up being the shady McCoy of this year. And I don't think that's going to sit very well with him, especially since he's been the guy his entire career. The good thing about this is that the Chiefs pretty much owe him nothing. The Jets cut him loose. And if he's, an, if he's a problem, if, if he starts bitching about his carries, starts bitching about his touches, They'll just say, we're going to run with the kid, and they'll cut him loose. There really is you – know, there's no downside to this deal. So if Le'Veon Bell minds his P's and Q's and actually mentors this kid, it could be a really good relationship. But it all really depends on Le'Veon Bell and his attitude. And you know what? That also plays into some breaking news that we had today. Antonio Brown to the Buccaneers instead of the Seahawks. So, it, to me, both of them, both of those situations are a very low-risk deal for the teams that sign them because if they start acting a fool, you can just get rid of them. Yeah, uh, 100%. I, I, don't, I don't really foresee either guy acting up and getting kicked out of the situation. Uh, one reason, I think Brown, this is his last shot, um, and he's choosing to go to Tampa – over the Seahawks because I know he's he sniffs a ring with Brady and company. I'm just a little surprised at why the Buccaneers felt they needed to add him. I don't I don't get is is Mike Evans not good enough? Is is Godwin not good enough? They have Rojo playing out of his mind right now. They got Fournette who's sitting on the bench. Like 
How many more weapons are you going to add to this offense? It's a fantastic question. And frankly, you can't add many more because there's still only one ball. I, I get OJ Howard got hurt, so there was room for one more. But that doesn't necessarily mean you needed one more. And you I mean Brady and Antonio Brown did have some crazy chemistry together before they cut him loose. But he's, he hasn't been playing for a bit. He just got off suspension. And Brady hasn't looked like Brady. So I really don't know if this is going to be the match that Tampa Bay thinks it's going to be. Because Gronk hasn't been what they thought he was going to be. Brady hasn't been nearly what we all thought he could be. So I really don't see anything. I really don't see anything good coming of this. Just like I don't see anything really interesting or anything of note coming from the Le'Veon Bell signing with the Chiefs. Like it's just another guy getting a paycheck. Like maybe he'll maybe he'll come up. Oh with yeah, him. and that's right. The Buccaneers also have Shady McCoy. Forgot they have him too. <laughs> yeah. It's just, you know, at, at some point, you know, you, you're just latching on for a ring, like you said. And honestly, I think Antonio Brown made a really grave miscalculation. I, I think Seattle is in much better position than Tampa Bay to win a ring as of right now. Now, whether or not that changes down the line, that remains to be seen. But, like, yeah, clearly DK Metcalf is the number one guy in Seattle, but you can slot in as a number two pretty easily here where you're behind, you're behind Evans. You're behind Godwin. You're behind Gronk. You're but behind, is he, you're behind, but Blake. is he, Izzy, is he going to be behind those guys? That's the thing. Like I'm looking at Mike's Evans numbers from the last game. And I'm like, man, Mike didn't get the ball. I Gronk mean, got yeah. the ball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gronk did get the ball. Rojo got the ball. How is Mike Evans not getting the football? Because Tom Brady's not getting the football. And I think that's part of the thing. I think Bruce Arians and Byron Leftwich are, you know, watching the game and you, they need to be adjusting on the fly. So, you know, you got to be calling some things differently. And if that means a heavy dose of Rojo to set up short passes, then that's what you got to do. And honestly, Mike Evans is probably going to suffer a little bit because of that. Yeah. I just, um, I just think they're setting they're setting themselves up right because now there's no excuses. There's literally no excuses. Yeah, they should go to the Super Bowl now. There's no. There, I don't want to hear about offensive line. Their defense has played outstanding in the last game, but they have really good players. And I know we differ in how we view Todd Bowles, but I think Todd Bowles is a solid coach. Uh, so. You know, there's no reason why you don't win the division, go to the title game, win the title game, and then depending on who you face in the Super Bowl, you should at least make it close. I mean, if you're playing the Chiefs in the Super Bowl, they're going to keep pace with you. Um, you play in the Titans in the Super Bowl, you know, those boys those boys seem like they can play. So uh should be interesting. It's going to be very interesting. And you, like you said, it this is a no-excuse move. Like the only thing that could possibly happen is Antonio Brown mouthing off. Like that's the only thing that could possibly torpedo this and they could just cut him. or Tom getting hurt or Tom getting hurt. And then you have to rely on Blaine Gabbert, but Hey, they could always get Ryan Fitzpatrick. Right. <laughs> it's time for the mail route on the fade route. If you want to join us, Email faderoutmail at gmail.com. Questions, comments, picks, you name it. Faderoutmail at gmail.com. So we have some mail this week as part of our new mail route segment. Woohoo! This is great. This from Randolph in Brooklyn. Subject is Pelicans. What's good, bros? Love the show. You think Stan Van Gundy's the right coach for the Pelicans? How will Zion do under him? Well, first and foremost, we thank you for the email, Ran. And I think it's a good hire. I think he's going to do good things for that organization. I always think 
of Zion in comparison to Dwight Howard. And Stan Van with Dwight Howard kind of was oil and water at some point. And to me, Zion seems a little bit more coachable. So I think it's going to be a good hire. And that team is on the come, you know? Yeah, I I, uh, I like the Van Gundy hire. I think he'll I think he'll develop Zion. But let's be let's all be real about this. It's a dead end job. It's a dead end job. Like he may coach the team for a year or two, but ultimately, th- that team needs at least two to three other players. As good as Zion is, they need help, and it doesn't it doesn't help the conference that they're in. So. Uh, I'm happy for Stan. I think he's going to do a great job developing Zion, and Zion will stay healthy, but it's a dead-end job. I mean, who really wants that job? Well, it it was perfect for a guy like Stan Van Gundy, who is ready, willing, able, hungry, and eager to get back into the coaching ranks. So a guy like a Mark Jackson probably would have tripped over himself to get an interview for that job, you know? Like guys on their way, guys who are out who want to get back in. Definitely a, a right, probably definitely a good fit in that regard. Somebody who just wants to prove themselves again. So, well, he knows basketball. I mean, the guy knows best. Guy's been around basketball his whole life. Like he knows basketball. No, Stan, Stan Van Gundy totally knows basketball. The thing is with him is that he wears out his welcome very quickly, just because of his expectations. And you know, he's a perfect. He would have been a perfect coach back in the nineties. He's just that kind of guy, like that kind of that kind of game, that kind of style fits back then. Now, with this athlete today, it has to be the right guy. And I think they put him with the right guy. So can this get them into the playoffs? I think so. How far they go, maybe, I mean, as presently constructed, Maybe they can top out at a six seed if everything breaks right. So, I mean, they're going to be hovering near the bottom of the of the the playoff bracket. But uh, the more experience Zion gets, and the more seasoning he gets with Stan Van Gundy, the better off he's going to be in the end run. And then eventually, Stan Van will get fired, and then they'll bring the other guy in, and the other guy will take them over the top. So that just seems to be his move. Right. Right, that's what that's what I foresee as well. Next message, next emails from HKP in the Bronx. Subject Rockets. How did the Rockets get better? Well, that was to the point. Um, well, Daryl Morey's out, so they're not. Maybe they won't be focusing on analytics as much. Uh, they, the analytics is what caused them to go small and ultimately trade Clint Capella. It seemed to work for them for a little bit, but. Honestly, it's just having a clear focus. I think having a clear focus on building a basketball team around Russell Westbrook and James Harden, you need a big, I, I don't, I don't understand why we're so anti big people, but you, you, somebody has to get the rebounds. Somebody has to get the rebounds. Somebody can get the putbacks. All points are good points. The whole point of the game is to outscore your team or the other team. So James Harden doesn't need to shoot all the time. Russell Westbrook doesn't need to shoot all the time. Get some more players around those two guys, and they'll instantly get better. Uh, I would trade James Harden for Giannis Antetokounmpo. Really? Yeah, because I'm not going to win with James and Russell Westbrook. No one's taking on the Russell Westbrook contract. I might be able to trade him to a sorry team like the Knicks and who might give me some stuff, but I'm trading James Harden for Giannis and I'm signing Giannis to an extension. I'm going to hope that Giannis and Westbrook could form a good duo to help me at least get to the Western Conference Championship and then I can figure it out from there. That's the way I would do it because it, like we talked about, they need a big guy. At least Giannis could be that big guy. Um then you try to sign on a couple of a couple of shooters because you're going to have Westbrook going to the basket and then you're going to have Westbrook on the nights where he can't hit anything. And you hope on those nights that Giannis gets his rebound and puts it back in or that Giannis could just carry the team. I mean, if Giannis is winning all those games in Milwaukee, if you give him a, a comparable 
player like Russell Westbrook or you team him with a I mean, you're not going to get Chris Paul, but if you get a Chris Paul, uh, you get him a true point guard, you might be able to go a little further. That's it. It's interesting that you, you immediately went to Giannis, and I don't really know if that will be an even swap, but I do find – I mean, I just had an idea. I'm throwing it against the wall, see what sticks. Call Philly about Joel Embiid. If you can't get those two to work together, maybe the Rockets would take a flyer on Embiid. Yeah, that's not a bad. It's not a bad idea either. I'm not sure how Doc would feel about it, but yeah, uh, somebody's got to be able to get. Somebody's got to be able to move the ball around. Yeah, there's too much dribbling for Harden. It takes too much dribbles for him to get to the basket. Too much dribbles from the score. Everyone's just watching him play, and you know we saw when they played the Lakers this year that you're not going to beat the Lakers. You're not going to beat teams that are bigger than you. No. Um, cause you know what? James Harden's best days, I believe are behind him. I don't think he's got better days coming forward. Okay. So we're going to try to utilize and get the best out of him right now. If we're lucky, we can get one trip to the, you really just trying to get one trip to the finals at this point. There's a lot of tread on that tire and the way he plays isn't helping. They, they need to figure something out for sure. You got to get a big somehow. And depending on your salary cap situation and what assets you have, it's possible but not likely that you can find somebody. Somebody's got to go. Like bottom, bottom line, some, one somebody's got to go. And more than likely, I mean, James Harden makes the most sense now. Like, what does that end up being? I'm not 100% sure. He's got the most value. Like teams would be interested in trying to get him. Yeah. Now, would if you're the Rockets, you'd send him to the East, correct? You wouldn't try and, you know, you wouldn't try and bury him in Siberia, you know, like trading to Sacramento for like Buddy Heald or something like that. No, you know? no, no. You need you need a you need value. And you want him to be on board with it too. I think he would make the Milwaukee Bucks great. I think that would be a great match for him. Play with Middleton and those guys? Mm. Why not? Well, Lopez, Lopez is still up there too. You have to also have to see because you have to match up the salaries and all that. Like one of those guys might be going back to Houston in the trade just to, just to balance out the finances. Well, try to of get it, Robin. You know? Try to get Robin Lopez. <laughs> get sideshow Bob. Yeah, yeah it's, probably, it's a great right. idea. <laughs> you need a big. You need someone to get rebound. You do need a big. Absolutely, you do need a big. And Robin Lopez is definitely going to hover more towards the basket than Brooke. Ever since Brooke discovered he can hit a three. Like all he's been doing is trying to hit threes. That's that's not good. Like you're 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 big, son. Go go to the hoop. Yeah, they can't. The, the 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 bottom line is this: is the Rockets cannot win with the current roster in an 82 game format in an 82 game season with the current playoff format no. in the West. The odds are stacked against them. On all accounts. The, the only way they can do it is to, I mean, if they're going to maintain the core of this roster, you you need to add an athletic big and then just go run and gun like Mike D'Antoni style. And talk to the Suns. See if they'd be interested in giving up DeAndre Ayton. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, it's worth a shot. You know, it's definitely worth a shot to explore the op- explore your options and then just go from there. But um, the Rockets definitely... Th- they're going the wrong way. I think we're in yeah. agreement on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. I think it's time for our pick segment. Not a bad week for me last week. I went eight and six. I could have done better, but, uh, you know, think these things happen. We had a, <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> but, you know, we're actually, you know, talking about sports and anything can happen in sports. Sometimes the team, sometimes the best team doesn't win. That, that's just the nature of the game, right? <laughs> That's why we play the game. We play to win the game, as the great Herm Edwards once said. All right. So this week, first one up, Steelers and Titans. I'm taking the Titans in this one. I'm taking the Titans, too. I think they're I think they're going to punch them in the mouth. Uh, you know, the, the game's in Tennessee, which was another reason why I think it helps them. Um but I think I think the Titans are for real. They showed a never quit, never die attitude. Again, again, he was against the Texans. But well, I'm I'm a believer. 
somebody's always got to go. And then I think in this case, it's going to be the Pittsburgh Steelers. O. Uh, Cowboys and the Washington football team. Honestly, both of these teams are so terrible. We're going to get into a bus crash on the way to the game. Right, and something's going to happen, you know. I've been, I've been thinking Cowboys, been leaning the Cowboys, and then I saw Andy Dalton and just that pathetic performance. And, you know, Chase Young is going to play, and they, they have a pass rush. I'm going with Washington. I'm going to go with the Cowboys. The, the Washington Redskins offense turns the ball over too much. They don't score enough points. Uh, I just don't – I don't foresee them uh, beating Dallas. Over, under, two dumb decisions by Riverboat Ron this week. I don't – but see, I don't think that you – I don't think he makes dumb decisions. I think he feels like, why not? We're one in five. What does it matter? Like, <laughs> we're not going to win the Super Bowl this year, so – Let's try things we not we might we don't normally try, you know. Speaking of that, we're gonna go with complete opposite because now it's talking about Jets Bills. Adam Gase <laughs> doesn't do yeah. anything. Bills versus COVID. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> this is the week. They win. No, he, this is he's the week. staying. He's not. He, but no, he no. Said things, hear me out. He hear said me today, out. today in a today in the press conference, he said things are progressing in the right direction for Sam Darnold. <laughs> Out the door. So. Out, he means out the door. <laughs> he asked him. Yeah, but this is the week they win one for Coach Gase and they carry him off. But no, they don't. The, the Bills are going to kick the shit out of this team. Like, it's not even going to be close. It'll be over at halftime. And the Bills have lost two in a row. Like They're going to be an ornery bunch. Nah, I don't see it. The, the Bills Man. are going to win this one. Man, I got the Falcons picking up another win against the Lions this week. Uh, I'm taking the Lions. You know, I, well, you are. I'm okay. taking the lines this week. I mean, the offenses are. It's going to be, and it's definitely going to be a shootout. I don't like the the Falcon defense at all. Raheem Morris. I mean, Raheem. Raheem Morris. He's he's better than Dan Quinn because he won a game. That's another good name for your son, Raheem Zinzi. Raheem Morris. Raheem, Raheem, Raheem Morris. Raheem. Wait, no, the whole thing. Raheem Morris Zinzi. That's not bad. Yeah. Raheem. <laughs> Raheem. Yes. But I'm, ta- um, I'm taking got, the Lions. I got the Browns beating the Bengals. Baker knows how to beat the Bengals. I'm of two minds about this. He should beat the Bengals. But this is the kind of game that they lose. <laughs> they, they just in, inexplicable. It's like walking down the street and stepping in dog shit because you didn't see it. <laughs> No Joe Mixon this week, though, so I think that helps. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely going to help. I'm going to take the Bengals. They're going to find a way to win. I, I just don't believe in Baker Mayfield. Yeah, most people don't at this point. <laughs> I, got the, I got the Panthers with an upset over the Saints. That's going to be a tough one considering the fact that Sanders and Thomas are going to be out. Like, you think that that would be the case. I'm going to stick with the Saints on this one. I think they're just going to run heavy with Kamara, and the Panthers don't have an answer for it. I got the Bucks beating the Raiders because, I mean, Raiders' offensive line was hit with COVID this week. They also are not going to have their star safety, Abrams, in the game. I, I'm going to take the Raiders on this one. It's a, it's a little out there, but who knows if they even play this game. Let's be, let's be yeah, real. I have a feeling they're gonna have to get moved. That's why they moved it out of the Sunday night spot because yeah. they they have they think it's gonna get moved. Yeah, uh, I've got Aaron Rodgers beating on the Texans, especially after last week. Aaron Rodgers is going to be in an extremely foul mood, and I feel bad for Romeo Cornell that he took that job. The Packers are gonna win pretty handily on this one. This was a tough one for me. Uh, I have the Bears beating the Rams. I believe in the Bears' defense. I don't believe in the Rams' offense. I'm going to take the Rams just because they're going. the The offense is going to do enough to win, and Aaron Donald is going to upset the timing of Nick Foles just enough to kind of cause some mayhem. I'm going to take the Rams in this one, and it's going to be close. It's definitely going to be close, but I'm going to take the Rams. I got the Chiefs beating the Broncos in the snow in Denver. 
Clyde Edwards Hilaire is going to have a game in the snow. Just run the rock, just pound it. And you know, Mahomes is going to, he's going to have a game, but there's no reason to, you know, there's no reason to throw it when you have a guy like Edwards Hilaire. Chiefs are going to win. I think the I think the Patriots fall again. 49ers come into Gillette and beat them. The Niners are getting healthy. The Pats, they don't have enough around Cam Newton. I'm taking the Niners as well. Yep. I think the Chargers beat on the Jags, and I think Gardner Minshew does not make it past halftime. The Gardner Minshew experiment is done, but they who was their backup? I don't even know. So, uh, yeah. Maybe a good candidate for Fitz Magic. Because mm. their offense is actually pretty good. Their running back has been playing really well. And Chark is good. Um, I'm surprised that they're not doing better. Um, and I'm not sure if it's all his fault or not. But. Well, no, uh, it, it, I, I don't think it's entirely Gardner Minshew's fault. You, you definitely traded some guys away. I mean, you got rid of Ngakwe, who got moved again. You got rid of – I mean, Calais Campbell wasn't there. Like, he's in Baltimore now with Ngakwe. Um, Leonard Fournette's not there. Like, it is what it is with this team. Like, there's – it's like a very much a no-name team. And the Chargers on paper are, are better. Justin Herbert is playing better than Gardner Minshew. So, I think the Chargers are going to win pretty easily. Looks like Jake Luton is the Jaguars' backup Who? quarterback. Oh, boy. Who? <laughs> Who? <laughs> Maybe we have a candidate for Sam Darnold. Oh, Tra- man. Trade him for the Jaguars. <laughs> uh, then the last game I have here, I got the Seahawks beating the Cardinals in a high-scoring shootout. This is going to – this has game of the week potential. This absolutely has game well, of the week potential. Well, that's why they moved it to Sunday night. Well, that and Rona. <laughs> Rona. This whole the you know, Rona game of the week. And everybody, this whole season is played with a flex schedule. So it's going to be a great game. The Seahawks defense, they give up a lot of yards. Kyler Murray's going to have a good game. Russell Wilson's going to have a good game. I, you know, Wilson and Metcalf, it, you know, it's gonna it's gonna strike again. I'm taking the Seahawks. Yeah, they seem they seem like they got it going on. Eventually, you know, they, people are gonna people are gonna sleep on them anymore. Like it, it's very strange to me that the Seahawks, that while they're good, people aren't pumping them up like they should be. You know, I think it's you know because you have the Titans, you have the Seahawks, you have the Steelers, and a lot of people are on the Titan train. But they, they kind oh, of- so Jake Jake Luton is the third string. Mike Glennon is this is the second. Oh string. God, Mike Glennon. Oh, Mike Glenn. Former Bear. Former Bear Mike Glennon. And former N- former, former NC Stater. Yes. Most quarterbacks that come out of NC State turn out to be studs. This guy was not one of them. No. Well, <laughs> you know, he certainly got paid like one. Yeah. I don't get that one, but hey, what more power to you, man. Count your millions. <laughs> yep. Well, this has been another episode of the Fade Route with D and Z. I am Z. That was D. Get at us. Fade Route Mail at gmail.com with questions, comments, picks. We'd love to hear from you. 100% we'd love to hear from you, and we will talk to you again next week. Have a good one, brother. Thanks for listening to this episode of our podcast. If you like what you heard and want to hear more, be sure to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Rate us five stars. Leave us a review. Turn on subscription notifications and tell your friends. Spread the word. Spread it wide.